Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to our School Health Advisory Council learning session. We're excited to have you with us. Um, I'm Michelle Smith. I am the State Coordinator for Texas Action for Healthy Kids and uh, have some great presenters with us today. We have, uh, first I guess let's do our logistics. Um, we are recording this workshop and we will send you a link um, sometime after within the next week with a copy of the PowerPoint as well as a link to the workshop on YouTube. Everyone is on mute and uh, if you have any trouble with your audio, you can always sign off, come back and try using your telephone uh, as an option to your computer speakers. If you have any questions, please put them in the question box. We have a question box and we have a chat box. Um, if you have a comment you wanna share about what you're hearing or an experience you've had as a SHAC member <clears throat> or with a SHAC, please, you can put those in the chat box. Um, those are great for us to save. And then um, we do have resources that we have listed on the uh, PowerPoint and we will provide a list of those resources to you. So just sit back and enjoy and uh, we will get started. As I mentioned, I'm Michelle Smith. Um, Alice Kirk is also with us. I haven't jumped her in, but she, she is going to be part of our group. Um, she is our volunteer chair and is with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Uh, Christine Ortega is part of our team here in Texas as well. She is uh, the Wellness Project Coordinator for Paso del Norte region um, down there. Our presenters today are Rachel Naylor. She is with Northeast ISD and is the District uh, Education, Physical Education, Health and Athletics Director. <clears throat> she has been involved with Shacks and with uh, Action Brother Kids for a long time and has lots of great experience. She started when she was 12. And then we have uh, Leo Reyes, who is the K through 12 Physical Education and Health Coordinator from Edinburgh. Uh, Leo has also helped out on webinars with us in the past and has some great experiences to share. And Stephanie Kellum, who is with United Healthcare and is a past SHAC chair for Fort Bend ISD. Um, Stephanie has been a great support and is part of our steering committee for Action for Healthy Kids. So um, we'll be circling back with each one of them and letting them share a bit about their district and then they will be part of uh, our panel when we have a Q and A a little bit later in this in the session. Okay, thanks, guys. <clears throat> Just a little bit about Action for Healthy Kids. We have been engaged in work with schools around nutrition and physical activity since 2002, when Dr. David Satcher, in his role as Surgeon General, declared we had an obesity epidemic. Teams from across the US gathered in Washington and I was lucky enough to be part of the Texas team and strategized on how we could have an impact through schools on children's health. Since that time, we've expanded our vision to not only focus on nutrition and physical activity, but to encompass the whole child model with a goal of having children active, healthy, and ready to learn. Please feel free to visit our website. Uh, we have a great amount of resources there on everything from nutrition, physical activity. Um, you'll also find other webinar act, uh, opportunities that National has put together, training sheets and tip sheets. So please join. We are here today to share information on school health advisory committees, specifically at the district level. I know a lot of uh, different districts may have advised school health committees on the campus level, but this is this is uh, strictly talking at the district level. So we had set up a separate group in Texas to discuss the issues around shacks and what they're facing and how could we best support them. Uh, and most recently, what role they should play in things like the reopening after COVID-19. This group includes several of our steering committee members and several of our school districts. And these learning sessions that we have today and tomorrow or a, a direct result of the work that this group has done over the last year. So um, we really appreciate all of their involvement and, and their willingness to go that extra mile for us. 
The agenda today, um, we're going to do a quick overview of, of SHACs, talk a little bit about the laws, the whole child and coordinated school health models. Um, and then we'll talk just briefly about wellness policies, which is something that most SHACs are involved with. Uh, and then we're going to give you a process to go through for making recommendations. Then we'll have our school districts um, discuss and answer some questions that we've shared with them in advance about how shacks operate and what makes a successful shack. And then we'll, we'll talk just briefly about some of the tools and resources that we're going to be able to share with you. So what is a shack? Shacks in Texas were originally formed back in the late 90s to allow parents and communities to have input on sexuality education. They've evolved over time to encompass all aspects of student health from nutrition and physical activity to social and emotional well-being. A shack is a district level advisory council that's uh, mandate is to assist the district in ensuring that local community values are reflected in the district health education and instruction. Shacks are mandated by state law, as I mentioned. Each school district in Texas should have a shack, and the shack should be appointed by the school board. Um, as I mentioned, it is a voice for parents and the community, and shacks are an excellent way to educate the district and the school board about how important health is to academic success. One of the keys to a successful shack is that all districts are required to have a coordinated school health program in Texas. There are so many different impacts on our children's health. This diagram illustrates how many different areas of school health are impacting our children. If these are not working together, you have chaos and who suffers? The child. But if all these parts are working together, you have a healthy, safe school environment that supports our children's success. Coordinated school health is mandated for grades K through eight in Texas. This is the eight component model that fits within the whole child model we will discuss next. And SHAC is responsible for recommending what coordinated school health program will be used or if a district will be developing their own. You'll find more information on coordinated school health programs on the Texas Education Agency website and we'll have those uh, addresses listed on the resource pages. Coordinated school health consists of eight components you see here. This was developed by the CDC uh, and the, the newer model, as I mentioned, is the whole child model, which has expanded these eight components to put extra emphasis on two of the areas. First, the social emotional climate of the school. So now you have uh, one component focusing on the physical environment and one on the social emotional environment. These replace the health and safety school environment. And then they took the parent and community involvement component and split it into uh, to recognize that the community does play a pivotal role um, and also that parents have a, a significant and yet different role. Um, these two were split in, in so that they each could be emphasized separately. When all these components are working together, you should have a healthy learning environment and students are fit, healthy and ready to learn. The whole school, whole community, whole child model incorporates the components of an effective school health program and the tenets of the whole child approach to education. This was developed to help in school district administrators and educators embrace the concept of the whole child, not just uh, teaching a brain. The model continues to focus on the traditional coordinated school health approach, but it aligns with the structure, framework, and objectives of education. You'll find a more detailed explanation on this model on the ASCD website, or you're also on the CDC website. So why do we need shacks? Well, shacks have become more and more essential because so many of the issues or risks our children face now are behavior-based. Um, when some of us were growing up, um, you had different things like mumps and measles and um, other types of worries that parents had, polio, a lot of the things have been eradicated and now there's a lot more issue with things that are identified as behavior based. And since our kids spend the majority of their days at school, it's important to recognize and support healthy behaviors there 
and ensure they have a safe and healthy learning environment. Shacks can definitely help make that happen. Shacks are the connection between schools and the district in all manners relating to health and wellness. Our schools are so overwhelmed with paperwork and testing, unless something is mandated, it sometimes gets ignored. Shacks can make sure the things that impact our children's ability to be successful, like getting physical activity, having nutritious lunches, um, making sure that they're not exposed to bullying, even making sure that they have a safe place to play. A lot of these items are driven by district policies and the shack can ensure that there are district policies that reflect the community and parent input on what's best for children. Shacks bring focus to the important role health plays in the learning environment. You're not just sending a brain to school to learn, you're sending a whole child. And if that child is hungry or tired or sick, they're not going to be successful. Shacks can bring focus to the whole child education, support the district and encourage parent involvement support schools and help drive district policies around health and wellness. Over the past 20 years, shacks have evolved. And there have been quite a few legislative mandates passed around shacks, what they should do and how they should do it. So exactly what laws should you be aware of in Texas? Um, to make sure that there is a parent administration over the shacks, um, there was a law put in place that says that the shack chair or co-chair must be a parent. <clears throat> this was just to ensure that the parents had the most input on a shack. Another requirement is that at least 50% of the shack be made up of parents. Again, to ensure that parents are uh, the loudest voice on the shack. Shacks must report to the school board at least once annually. If uh, they can, it's highly recommended that that be in person. Uh, I know when I was with Austin ISD Shack, we always went and met with the board at least once a year. So they knew who we were, they had a visual sighting and they were reminded about what Shacks did and how important we were. Shacks must meet at least four times annually. Um, in some districts, Shacks were only meeting once a year and they can't really do a lot if you're only meeting one time a year. So we went to the legislature and asked that, you know, they help us out. And so now shacks are required to meet at least four times a year. Shacks must be comprised of at least five members and they should be appointed by the board. There's a lot of confusion over this one. Uh, the, the intent was that a shack have at least five members. The intent is also that all shack members should be appointed by the board. Some districts have thought this meant, okay, so you sh the board only appoints five of the members. That's not the intent. The intent is that the board appoints the members. That doesn't mean the board has to go out and find them. Um, a lot of shacks have a committee that does recruitment, um, that looks at how, where their members are, tries to make sure that they're representative of the community and of different districts. Um, and board members should certainly have the option of identifying members for the shack, but it's really helpful if they can have some support from the shack itself on identifying members and make sure that there are at least five. The majority of shack members, as I mentioned, must be parents, but they also must be parents of children in the district and not employed by the district. It's not that parents who work for the district aren't welcome on the shack. This was just a way to make sure that there were voices that would not be um, in jeopardy if they wanted something that did not align with what the district position might be. So um, all parents are welcome on the shack, but there should be a representative number of parents who do not work for the district. And another one is that shack recommendations are to be made to the school board. Uh, this is not a district committee. This is a separate committee that should uh, be considered as reporting to the board. This doesn't mean that the shack should go around the district. The shack should work with the district. The district should always be aware of what the shack's feelings and recommendations are. But it does mean if the shack and the district disagree, the shack can still make their recommendation directly to the school board. Other things um, that shack, some of the things that shacks should be dealing with and making recommendations are, uh, the number of hours of health education instruction, 
um, policies and procedures, strategies, curriculum design to prevent obesity, CVD, type 2 diabetes, and mental health concerns. These should be addressed through the coordinated school health program framework that uh, SHACs have also identified. Human sexuality instruction. Um, SHAC should also be looking at joint use agreements or other ways for the school district and the community to collaborate and, and let uh, outside organizations and individuals have access to school facilities, which can be very important in areas where sometimes the school's facilities may be the only gym or maybe the only track in the area. And then uh, SHACs are also designated to review and make a recommendation on recess. Um, does it mean that they have to enforce recess, but they should have looked at um, and made recommendations around recess. One of the last uh, mandates that was passed was around physical activity. Um, SHACs are required to have a physical activity subcommittee that considers and makes recommendations on how to increase physical activity during the school day. District policies. Every district that participates in a SHAC uh, in a school meal program is required to have wellness policies. The SHAC should be part of the creation and implementation of these district wellness policies. These policies create supportive school nutrition and physical activity environments to promote school wellness. Where did they come from? Well, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 uh, set these up and required districts, or actually it was an earlier one. This was the second round in 2010, uh, requires districts or local school wellness policies to include nutrition guidelines for all foods and beverages available on school campuses during the school day. These guidelines have to be consistent with federal regulations for school meals and the smart snack uh, nutrition standards, which cover all the competitive food sold on campus through the school day, including vending machines, uh, a la carte lines in the cafeteria, school stores, and any types of fundraisers. Schools should also be restricting the marketing and advertising on the campus to only those foods and beverages that meet the smart snacks and school nutrition standards. In 2016, the final local school wellness policy rule was passed. The requirements you see on your screen were approved and are now required by school districts uh, and schools, uh, including requiring reporting to the public on policy content and implementation and annual reporting or updates to the policy. Uh, most of the school districts that I'm aware of have these policies posted on their website or have a link to the policies um, as they're uh, posted through TASB. Stakeholders and certain groups must be allowed to participate in the local wellness policy development, implementation, review, and updates. This is where SHACs come in. The district could choose to set up a totally separate committee to do wellness policies, but if there's a strong SHAC in place, it is the perfect group to work on wellness policies. The district must conduct an assessment of the local wellness policies at least every three years. This is something that uh, is done locally and then the Texas Department of Agriculture is the organization that oversees wellness policies and they will come in and review those policies once every three years when they do their nutrition audits. It should include goals for nutrition promotion as well as nutrition education and it must include policies that permit marketing of only the foods and beverages that are consistent with smart snack standards, which we mentioned before. So we have some separate web workshops and there's also videos on wellness policies uh, if you want more details around that. I'm gonna stop for just a minute and ask my panelists if they would like to weigh in on wellness policies and how, they've, how their shacks have been involved. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for just a moment and let you guys join us. Michelle, I, uh, wellness policies are really the backbone of, of shacks in the sense that it all comes from parents, the stakeholders, and um, 
for example, recess. Recess at elementary is almost essential in a lot of schools. Um, some schools don't, you know, do not incorporate that. So therefore, you can go out there and make that recommendation and make it into policy where it's consistent throughout the district. But the thing about policy is that once it's in the local policy, uh, pretty much it's it's a blueprint for campuses to follow. And believe it or not, a lot of these policies come from ideas from parents who are important stakeholders in the shack, making those recommendations which go to the shack, which is then recommended to the superintendent and board for uh, you know, for implementation in, in local policy. So it's very important that uh, parents on the shack, you know, realize that their ideas can come to fruition in the form of policy making for, for uh, local campuses and districts. Thanks, Leo. Stephanie, do you, have, you want to share a bit about your wellness policy work? Sure, yes, I would agree with Leo. Um, I really do, uh, I think the backbone um, essence of a wellness policy is so true. And I think, um, you know, when you're trying to, to fight for, you know, policies and you're trying to fight for what's right, you know, giving kids recess, things like that, the wellness policy comes into play because it's policy and it's, and it's in there. And so I think understanding what your wellness policy says is a really good first step. I think, you know, districts are at different levels about where policy is at. Um, but continually looking at your wellness policy also is really valuable um, to see if, you know, changes do need to be made. It's a big comprehensive policy. And so doing annual reviews um, and implementation studies around it, I think are important to understand how the campuses are leveraging the wellness policy. Um, if things are actually being implemented and are you being held accountable for those things? And then going back to the drawing board and saying, does this really work still in the environment we're in? I know with COVID too, you know, we've had to change a lot of the ways we deal with things, especially as it relates to recess. So looking at your policy and, and understanding how that impacts the campuses at a global level is very important. And so, you know, we do a very, um, I think, robust job in Fort Bend ISD of ensuring that our policy speaks to our practice. And reviewing that policy, we leverage our subcommittees to review sections of the policy that they're experts in um, to make sure that we have a um, diverse representation because we want parents to look at that. We want community members to look at that. And we want staff members to look at that. And I think the more that people understand what's in that policy, the better advocates they can be for wellness in general. Thanks. Rachel. I don't think I have anything to add that the two, um, Stephanie and Leo already said, I, again, the wellness policy is kind of was our starting point as well as really making our shack a lot stronger. It is important to have an evaluation process, um, but that group that has to review those policies every three years, the shack is a great place to utilize for doing that. So do y'all, do you have like a subcommittee that works on wellness policies or does the district bring you a draft and then y'all discuss it or how does that work? Um, I, I actually, when we when I present a little bit, that's one of the things we'll hit. We actually do an okay. ad hoc committee from that, from the shack. So we look at it as the wellness policy is not something we're touching every single meeting. So it is not a need to be in a committee duty, but it is something we're gonna touch every two or three years to review and make sure we're up to date, especially if new legislation comes down. So we'll create an ad hoc committee amongst our members. And then that group will meet and go over the wellness policy. Awesome. Okay. Anybody Michelle, else? I, 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 do, I do agree with, uh, with Rachel in, in the sense that uh, as, as you have legislation that comes about that requires um, certain laws to be implemented in schools. You do have a ad hoc committee of different members of the of your organization. For example, nutrition, uh, mental health, uh, physical education, uh, health services, and that committee goes out there, and they're the ones that make those recommendations. That usually go to the shack, and then also go into policy making. And it, it's not something that you probably do every year, but you do it every couple of years, like Rachel said, to make sure that you are adhering to all the legislation that has been passed, uh, dealing with school health, the whole child and so forth. I forgot to mention that uh, a couple of years back, uh, we received a grant for a recess. We did not have recess in all our campuses, but the grant 
required us to have recess. So therefore, principals that were not having recess uh, had to have recess. However, in order to have sustainability, we made a recommendation to and had the uh, physical education subcommittee make that recommendation to have recess so it could be sustained because we had a couple of principals that were politically connected that were not going to have recess, even though they knew the benefits of it. So the SHAC subcommittee recommended that. And uh, as a result, it's re it's now mandated in all our schools here in Edinburgh because of that. But it all started with a, a mandate and having it go, go to policy. Steph, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, so I, again, I, I think everyone, everyone talks, they think of other things. And I think the one thing that um, I also wanted to mention is um, policy can be overwhelming. And so I think, especially to SHAC members um, who, you know, think that, hey, we joined the SHAC because, you know, we're passionate about healthy eating. And then all of a sudden you want me to write policy. Um, and so I think helping to equip your members too with the skills they need to better understand what policy is. We just, we did policy training for our members. So we brought in people that could speak to policy, um, district employees, but also our school board member. We have a strong school board member who advocates for wellness um, at the district level. And she explained policy in her eyes as a school board member and the impact it can have as well. So I think um, it is overwhelming to think, oh man, I have to write policy but I think there are resources available to you within the district that can support that writing and also explaining that to your SHAC members to understand that what, you know, what local policy is, what legal policy is, what are regulations, really just kind of clarify all those, um, those details that exist within the policy world, I think are important so that people feel more comfortable contributing and, and giving um, their thoughts and, and feedback. So true. I mean, the takeaway here from all of you is I think, you know, um, don't be intimidated. Um, get get the right people involved. Know what it is you want to accomplish, and then the district can help you uh, make the language work. Um, if you want to make sure that you know recess is mandatory for all campuses, um, put that in writing to the district, and then have the district uh, figure out the best way to express it in the legal language in which of the policies it goes into, because it can be very confusing. We, we, as I mentioned, have done several um, workshops around wellness policies, and I believe there's some videos that you can get through YouTube on that as well if you're interested in more. Okay, thanks guys. Let's go back to uh, oops. the <clears throat> final thing that I want to walk through with you today which is uh, making recommendations as a shack. We've identified five basic steps. The first one is laying groundwork. You have to define your need and clarify your objective, make sure what it is that you're trying to share. For example, uh, if, if you have a high number of students in your district who are overweight and obese and they have access to vending machines with unhealthy items in them, uh, the shack wants to make a recommendation on changing what's being made available through those vending machines. What steps would you take? Well, you'd need to identify who's responsible for vending at the district, then find out uh, what, when the vending contracts are renewed. Uh, as a uh, recommendation, there's an organization called the Center for Science and the Public Interest, or CSPI, and they have some great resources on vending that you could access and review. You can also look to the USDA who have school nutrition policies and ask that the vending items in your district meet the same requirements as what USDA has. Or maybe you feel the campuses are not following rules that are already in place around healthy events. You can make a request that the district send information out on the district policy, but not just send the, send the policy, but um, include options which the SHAC can help develop that schools can use um, as they're trying to improve their health of their campus. Also make sure that you alert your PTA and parent group so they can be supportive on implementation. So any recommendations your SHAC is going to make need to, be, need to involve everyone who's going to be affected. You can't be successful if you don't have people engaged and aware. So make sure you ask students how they feel about something you're trying to change. If it involves vending, uh, make sure you ask the principal 
by involving them in the beginning, you're gonna identify any issues they might have and be better prepared to respond down the road. For instance, principals get upset about vending because they view it as a revenue stream. You need to make sure you can share information that shows vending will not decline if they have healthy snacks. Positive communication can help you build support and awareness. If you can involve students in the support of your recommendation, it'll be easier to sell to other students down the road. <coughs> Draft the recommendation. You've investigated the issue and built awareness and you have enough information to start drafting a recommendation. The entire shack doesn't have to be part of this process. You can, may want a subcommittee with outside expertise. If you're talking about healthy eating, tap into a nutritionist along with some students and parents and school staff. Once you've reviewed any existing policies, all districts have those wellness policies and they, they need to be updated and reviewed. So make sure you've seen what is actually there. Sometimes it may be more a case of implementation than it is a case of actually the policy. But uh, ask your district, if they don't have it on the website, ask your district where you might find a copy of your wellness policies. Uh, and you can also find on the NASB website, National Association of State Boards of Education. Uh, we will give you that link later. They have a lot of sample policies from all across the US from uh, different states and different districts. Draft a recommendation that's clear and simple and specific and make sure you say exactly what you want. As you've seen on some of the uh, mandates from the legislature, uh, if it's not clear, it can be misinterpreted. So making sure that what you want to happen is very clear and then the legal department can help uh, form it into the right policy. But even if you uh, get it approved, you need to make sure that you're gonna be around for the, for the follow-up. And getting the recommendation approved. Once your subcommittee has a recommendation drafted, talk, it needs to be presented to the entire shack. Uh, and discussed and possibly modified. Sometimes the, the whole shack may have a little bit different take on things and you'll need to get their approval. If there are any legal issues, you need to make sure that there's nothing that you're uh, going to run into down the road from the legal department. If there's a contract already in place around vending, um, then you may need to make sure that any dates you put in there, um, consider those, those contract dates. Then a motion can be made uh, from a SHAC subcommittee or from another SHAC member and have the SHAC vote on the motion. Once you have a recommendation, those should be shared with your district administration. Um, hopefully you have some district administration on your SHAC who can give you feedback while you're going through the process. But if not, um, you definitely need to meet with them once you have your recommendation and get their input. Sometimes they may point out things that you might not have realized that could have an impact on what you're suggesting. Doesn't mean that they have to agree with your recommendation or that it can't go to the board if they don't agree. But if you want something to be successful, um, having district input and district approval is the best way. Um, you can take something to the board. You're, you are a board committee, not a district committee. But again, the board may not want to hear something if the district is not supportive of it. Um, but that's, like I said, that's part of how you need to move forward. If your shack feels strongly, you know, you can ask to present directly to the board, um, but they may or may not act. So if you present to the board, um, like for instance, on recess, um, you are required to review and make recommendations on recess but the board may choose not to accept your recommendation. So that's why it's critical in the early stages as you're working on this to educate your board members, educate your school administrators as to why recess is important, um, how it can work and how it's worked and how it's improved academic scores in, in different districts. There's a lot of really good information out there around recess particularly. Um, and then once you get to the point um, of presenting your recommendation, Hopefully, if they're aware and and you know understand the importance of it, they'll they'll approve your recommendation. But it's not always going to get approved the first time, so don't give up. Um, identify what the issues are, 
and find out how you can walk around those. I know it took us six years to get a recess policy passed the way we wanted it in Austin, um, but it was worth the wait. And it, you know, we, it took that long to educate and get it the right people in the right places. So we don't give up just because it didn't happen the first time. Then you implement. Um, getting it passed is great, but if it isn't implemented, it's kind of pointless. We have a lot of that when it comes to state laws. Some districts may not even be aware of some of the things they're supposed to be doing, so they're obviously not implementing. Um, so work with the district to develop implementation guidelines. Don't just send something out to a, to a school and say our campus and say, this is your new policy. Make sure that there's information sent with the policy that explains how it can be implemented, why it's being implemented. Um, if the district does not send complete information out, and this is where I feel like the shack really needs to help make sure that that's gonna happen. Also need to make sure that parents are aware of any new policies. Um, they are the people that are gonna know if it's being implemented on the campus or not. So make sure that parents are made aware of uh, whatever policies are passed. Okay, I think that's probably enough about um, the processes. If you have questions, I haven't seen anything in the question box, but we have some of our experts here who will be able to uh, share a lot more information. But first I've asked them uh, to share a little bit of information about their district and about their shacks. <clears throat> and then we have some questions we're gonna ask them um, as a panel as soon as we get through. I know that uh, we are gonna ask Rachel to share a little bit more in depth about their processes when we get to her. But Stephanie, would you like to? Absolutely, all right. So um, I thought it would be helpful. I always know when I'm, I'm sitting on webinars, I'm thinking to myself, so what does this district look like? Is it similar to my district? Is it rural? Is it urban? Um, so just to better understand what Fort Bend um, ISD looks like, um, Fort Bend ISD is a suburb of Houston, is in a suburb of Houston, so it, it encompasses several cities, including the largest one is Sugarland um, and Missouri City. Um, it's the eighth largest district in Texas. Um, we have 81 campuses and are continually adding more campuses. It's very, it's growing um, as it, as most suburbs in Texas are. Um, 77,000 um, plus students, 11,000 um, employees about 45 percent free and reduced lunch and our, our percentages range at campuses from you know some campuses are up to 95 percent free and reduced and then we have some campuses as low as five percent free and reduced um, and we have 90 um, plus language and dialects spoken to we're a very very diverse district um, which i think has benefited our strategies for um, implementing wellness programs just because we had to look at um, at the programs through a variety of lenses. And so we had to consider um, a lot of differences that exist within the district. Um, not every campus is the same. And I think approaching that um, overall is really important when implementing wellness programs. All right, next slide. Um, so I thought also, if you guys wanna go and, and check out, um, we have a website. Um, so it's forbenisd.com shack. Uh, we also have a Twitter handle, so um, we'd love for you to follow us. Uh, we use that as a communication tool to get information out um, and just raise awareness. Um, we find that communication is probably one of our biggest challenges in a district this size, um, is really leveraging as many communication channels as we can. So between emails and, and newsletters, announcements, social media, um, word of mouth, all those different things um, we try to accomplish um, to guarantee that our messages are shared across the district um, of that size. We do meet six times a year, um, which I think is a, is a great number. I know that um, the law states that four times is the minimum, um, but as Michelle mentioned earlier, I do think that the more often you meet, the more consistent your messaging is. Um, and so, you know, when you have bigger breaks between meetings, um, things tend to not um, 
be as fluid. Um, people don't remember kind of what we talked about the last meeting or they're a little bit more disengaged. Um, and so the more frequency that you have with those meetings, I think the more you can accomplish. We also have seven subcommittees. And so our subcommittees can change year to year. Um, we have your traditional subcommittees like child nutrition, um, physical activity, PE health. Um, we have a social emotional learning subcommittee. Uh, we have a health services subcommittee. We have um, a um, family and community involvement subcommittee, but our newest subcommittee that we started this year is actually a legislative subcommittee, um, really focusing on advocacy and informing our members um, about the legislative process because we currently are in session. And so this was actually a really important goal for us to make sure that we can communicate what's happening at a state level um, because that impacts us locally. And, and really kind of inform, also we found that it's important to inform our representation in the local level about shacks. Um, several representatives that have been to our legislative subcommittee meetings have said, I've never heard of a shack before. This is a really interesting group. And so I think, you know, we're always trying to do education around um, the benefit of shacks, and shacks exist at every school district um, and the power that that voice can have. Um, we have 33 members currently. We are um, more than 50% parent-based. Um, and we have actually a very strong parent presence. So our shack chair um, is, a, is a parent um, as per the law. Um, but really, the, the chair runs the meetings, builds the agendas. We have a strong executive committee. Um, and we also have a membership committee that um, engages with new members when they come on to make sure they understand the processes. Um, so we really, we really tried to build this infrastructure that exists within our shack to ensure that there's some consistency um, for um, the members that are a part of the shack. Um, and we do have formal bylaws as well that we vote on. Um, we recently have updated them as well because those have, those have changed, um, especially in our COVID setting. Um, so really kind of reflecting on what the laws are that exist within the shack um, is important as well. Next slide. So I thought I'd list our key priorities. Um, and really, I think, I've mentioned the, the infrastructure, I think defining roles within the shack. Um, so everyone plays a part, but I think if people are assigned a, um, a role but don't really have any details around that role, it's really hard to engage. So we um, have actually made job aids um, or job descriptions for certain roles so that there's better understanding around what um, actually should be happening with certain roles like the chair, our vice chair, our secretary, things like that. So really kind of being more specific around um, what individuals are um, being tasked to do and how that communication process works. Um, we are focused, like we mentioned earlier, on collecting the data to understand how the wellness policy implementation is, is going um, and better understanding what our district statistics look at. We look at a variety of data sources to inform ourselves around what mental health challenges we're seeing in students, um, what nutrition challenges we're seeing in students, uh, physical activity challenges, a variety of resources are available. And so we often have the district present to our, our SHAC on what that data looks like and any kind of programs that are being implemented based on that data. Um, engaging multiple stakeholders. So I think that was mentioned earlier as well, but collaboration is key. And I think really mixing between the community, the parents and the district employees is crucial. And that's what makes Shack successful is hearing everybody's viewpoints, engaging at the different levels. And so we really try to make an environment that allows for this to happen. Um, again, it's been more challenging during COVID, during Zoom meetings, um, and not meeting in person to really have that genuine conversation and engagement. But we, again, are focused on making sure that there's a voice for everybody and there's an ability for people to give their input and feedback um, in the process. I think it's also very important to share successes. Um, things sometimes don't move as quickly as you'd like in school districts. Um, and so I think members can feel a little bit disillusioned. Um, and so really highlighting successes that you see um, as you move along the process and sharing those back with the, the shack is important. I don't think you can repeat it enough because again, as we talked about, if you're only meeting six times a year, you know, there's, there's, there's breaks between those meetings, which can be challenging for the, um, for the individuals to remember what we've talked about. So really sharing successes, supporting others too. I think that's important. We've created a shack award to recognize those 
wellness champions within our district that need that extra support, that recognition. It also allows us to learn about best practices that are happening. But we can, you know, we can be that cheerleader for those individuals and support them um, at a district level, which is important. Um, you know, recognition is also a big thing we found to be a benefit in the district. And so really kind of giving them a shout out to certain individuals who are going that extra mile or, you know, dedicating their time to support wellness in the district has been important. Um, and then just have patience. I, I, like I said, things don't happen overnight. Um, you know, you work on a wellness policy and you'll submit it to the district and it'll come back and it'll look different. Um, but as Michelle said, that's really important. I think, you know, we have great vision. Um, as community members and parents, we really want to see the best for the community and the schools. And oftentimes, you know, PE every day sounds like a great thing, but we don't think about the building capacity. We don't think about staffing. We don't think about scheduling. And so PE every day would require a huge transformation in how things are done. And so um, really, you know, having that understanding and that collaborative mindset of how we could make the ultimate goal happen, you know, is there compromise? What would this look like? And really understanding how the systems work, I think is important as well. Um, there's always a little bit of give and take um, with being a, being a SHAC member and understanding that, you know, you can't get it all, but your voice is so important. And, and I can't say that enough. I think SHAC voice is very powerful. Um, and the better equipped you are to speak up and, and to share um, the challenges and the successes that you're seeing at your campuses is so important. So um, that's all I have on a Fort Bend front. Thanks, Stephanie. <clears throat> all right, Leo, you've um, put your video on and share information about your chat. All right, let me, I think you all can hear me. Let me see if I can have my video on there. I'm hoping that my video will be coming back on, but uh, great job, Stephanie, as far as explaining uh, about your shack and, and realizing that they are an important voice for changes in the district or, or changes, you know, uh, but the thing about it is that a lot of times uh, parents on the shack grow impatient and want things done quickly. And before change can happen, a lot of times they're gonna, superintendents and directors are gonna be asking to see if, uh, you know, there's consensus and that's where your subcommittees come in. For example, recess, going up to your principals that are the stakeholders and talking to them to see how it affects them. And then making sure that we have consensus with directors before it goes to the superintendent. Because most of the time a school board is gonna turn around and ask the superintendent and, and the uh, central administrators, is, is there, was there a clear communication between the shack and, and the, the stakeholders, whether it's students, whether it's teachers or whether it's administrators. Uh, one of the things that we've done here in Edinburgh CISD is We've actually um, are in collaboration with uh, our university uh, uh, administration. So, for example, we have uh, part of our shack. We have the uh, UTRGV, which is a uh, four-year college here in Edinburgh. We have their nurse, their nurse department head as part of our shack, and we also have our physician's assistant uh, chairperson as part of our shack. And then we also have another member with is the Texas A&M uh, Mac Allen University uh, uh, Health uh, Department Shack as well. So therefore, extending with them has really helped us as far as getting data and keeping up on current trends because they are uh, at the forefront of research. They are, you know, uh, working with student policies and stuff like that. So that has been a really big uh, assistance with our school district. But here again, going back to uh, recruitment of, of uh, parents, it's it's very important that you continue to try to have a diverse group of parents, whether it's students or parents with students with special uh, with student with excuse me with disabilities, and uh, having you know a diverse number of parents that have wide wide range of views. We do have a superintendents council for parents, and we do get a lot of our members there. We also ask for recommendations from schools on parents that are advocates of health and wellness 
And of course, we look within our district that we have employees that happen to be parents of students within our district. So that is always our biggest challenge is trying to keep a diverse number of parents uh, that are recruited to be on your chat. But during these times, like Stephanie said, with COVID, uh, it has been extremely challenging because a lot of times um, you're, you're not able to meet, you have not been able to meet in person and you're meeting virtually. Uh, we've had some parents that have had problems with uh, virtual and computers and stuff, and we've had to make amendments, but it just seems like virtual meetings don't have the same effect as meeting in person. So therefore, uh, my advice to, uh, you know, some of the you know, some of this persons that are in this conference is to try to have a subcommittee to recruit parents and making sure that there's an open invitation to parents in, in your school district, you know, to be part of the shack and make them realize, like Stephanie said, that, you know, we are a recommend, we are a recommending body to the superintendent and the board. However, some of these changes do take time and a lot of it has to be research based and, and a database before it can actually come to fruitation. Thanks, Leah, I appreciate it. Okay. <clears throat> Rachel, we're gonna ask you to share a bit more about your shack and your process. Well, I don't want to repeat. I will probably say some similar things to what Leo and Stephanie have already shared, as well as Michelle. Um, but I think your structure is extremely important. Um, we all know that in our classrooms, when we're teaching, the structure of our classroom can make or break the success of our classroom. And so I think the thing, same thing goes to the structure of a shack as well. Um, just a little bit of background. Northeast ISD is located in San Antonio, Texas. Um, our school district actually encompasses around uh, the airport area and out to 1604. It says Northeast, but I really think when you look on the map, we're really more North side, but we already have a North side ISD. So it makes it a little funky when you start looking for our district on a map. Um, we have about 64,000 students and we are sitting at 67 campuses of that um, 45 or elementary campuses. One is a pre-K campus. To give you a little bit of an idea, um, next slide, please. So basic structure, I always feel like when I talk to people about shacks, the first thing they need to do is see what their district has already established for a shack. If they're taking over a shack or if they're starting a shack, you need to look at your legal, local regulations, guidelines, and then the district way. So for example, um, the Texas Education Code pushes a lot of stuff down into our legal, which we can't change. We have to follow that. That is the basic minimum of what a shack would have to follow. But then your local school district can make it a policy to take those legal a next step. And then regulations are, how are you going to make the local and legal work? Um, usually in our district, a local has to go to the board for change. Regulation can be changed by executive staff. And then there are guidelines. Um, those are usually the things that we have established. They're really only for the knowledge base of the group that's working amongst those. And then there's the district way. I kind of laugh at that because sometimes every district just has the way they've always done it. And you just have to kind of be aware of that. I think these are important things to share with your SHAC members. Um, when we have a beginning of the school year, we go through these things so they understand if they're trying to change something in the district, they understood where they need to begin to try to make that change. Next slide, please. Steps to success, um, brainstorm your state quarter, stakeholders. Make sure that you have everybody to the table that needs to be there. And it shouldn't always be people that think like you or think like the group overall. It needs to be a very diverse group. Leo mentioned that. It needs to represent large parts of your um, school district. You have a very big district. We try to make sure that we have um, at least four parents from each of our clusters on our shack at all times. Um, we also try to make sure that you include your district personnel. When we get into committees, we notice a lot of time that our committees were struggling to move forward in their work, but it was because they were missing someone that would have been vital piece of information or share with regards to district information. So we have put those people on the shack so that they can have access to them on a regular basis. But if it's not someone that needs to be on the shack on a regular basis, the committees know that they can invite people to come and sit in their committees and provide information or present to them. Always research and seek understanding. I think it's important for shacks to 
make sure that they understand all the things, the lay of the ground. Uh, Michelle kind of alluded to it earlier when you talk about like a vending contract. You may want to change your vending, but you have to make sure that you're aware of the contracts and what are already set up in the school district because it's not that the district doesn't want to consider your recommendation, it's that they can't because of legal bindings with a contract. Uh, make sure you're designating the leaders. Um, obviously, a parent needs to be in that group, but it also in your committees. We have chairs at the committees as well, and usually we have a facil district facilitator that helps that chair. Uh, make sure that you're gathering your district. I always think one of the most important things is making sure you're very transparent in your district and that everybody knows what you're trying to achieve. If something is getting ready to go forward, make sure that you're sharing that information with the people who need to know about it. Next slide. WIC Reauthorization Act really sort of, sort of kicked our shack to a whole nother level. Um, at this point in time, it's been redone multiple times over, but at that point in time, when that came around, there was recess, class sizes, minutes, certifications, all these kind of things had to be worked into your policy. And so that took our shack to the point of understanding a really good structure for us to be able to work around, which is what we were all saying earlier, your wellness policy, which was the um, product of the WIC Reauthorization Act of 2004. Okay, Michelle. Evaluation, coming out of that WIC Reauthorization Act and really tightening up what our SHAC would look like, we utilize the School Health Index for our evaluation of our wellness policy. Um, every two years, our campuses complete the, the SHI. That data gets um, turned into our school nutrition department. And then we take that information, aggregate it, and give it to the committees. And they go through it, and they make their recommendations based off of the outcomes that we find in that data. Um, we usually set a, a bar like three is the best in the SHI. So we may say anything that's a 2.3 or higher um, please look at it and see if we need to make a recommendation. What our SHAC has found out is that we may have regulations or policies or guidelines in place for the area that is being marked down lower, but the communication on that has been low. And so then they will go into looking, how can we communicate better about our plan as a district with regards to something we already have in place? If you'll move us forward, please. Thank you. Um, as I was saying earlier, we do ad hoc committees for if we're looking at a particular policy or anything like that, but our regular committees that meet um, usually every other meeting, we have about seven to eight meetings a year and every other meeting is usually a committee meeting, but they are meeting on their recommendations and moving forward on what they are trying to achieve to improve our SHI overall. So that isn't really the place for them to go through and necessarily look at policy. So what we will do is if we have to review policy, which we do every few years, then we'll pull an ad hoc committee that will meet separately from our various SHAC members, which include a lot of district people as well as parents who want to be part of that committee. And then the action implementation of your approved recommendations. Once you get recommendations coming out of a committee, obviously they have to go forward to your SHAC. The committees present them to the whole SHAC. The SHAC approves those recommendations, and then the recommendations move forward to executive staff, which is our superintendent and his staff, as well as the board. We also include those recommendations in our annual report. Next slide, please. Consistency. I think it's extremely important to be very consistent on your members on how you adhere to your policies. Um, your SHAC regulations are extremely important for you to follow. We do not have bylaws. We actually use um, a regulation that comes off of one of the governance pieces that are in the education code. And we use that regulation to govern our SHAC. And next slide, please. And this is our moment of pride. It's um, from November, 2015, if I am not mistaken. Um, we started our K Shack in the spring of 2015 with a thought process that we would be able to bring students and adults together to make decisions and get feedback from students on our recommendations. Sometimes um, a recommendation may not be appropriate for students, so a committee would not necessarily include them on that. But most of the time, if we're talking about nutrition, we're talking about changing recess, we're doing one of the things, we want a student voice. They're our customer as well as our parents. And while we have parents on there, the student voice is often lost in that. So we started in, 2014, in 2015, 
gathering um, students and getting them involved. And in 2015, we, we, in November of 2015, we hosted our first joint meeting with them. And this is a picture of that group. Next slide. And if you have any questions, we're available, but thank you very much. Thanks, Rachel. So we have a group of questions, but before we get into these, I have one <clears throat> that uh, you can all ask, answer. Do school administrators typically attend SHAC meetings or are they our officers? And should we invite principals, counselors, uh, and superintendent? I would say there was always representatives at the Austin ISD shack from the district, from the different departments who attended almost every month. Um, they gave us updates on what was going on in their departments. We had a school board member who was uh, administrator uh, who, who attended our meetings as well, which was very helpful. So if you can get them to attend, it's your, your five steps ahead of the game in most cases because they can give you some great input. Uh, so I would, in inviting principals, counselors, yes, um, the more aware they are, the more likely they're going to be to um, help you with something. Okay, you, you guys, you want to share any information? I've I think <laughs> I would love to also echo that. I think the other thing to note is that, um, so especially because of COVID, we've moved to Zoom meetings and we've had a lot more principal engagement, a lot more account, like a lot more people have been able to jump on the call, which has been helpful, uh, or our meetings. Um, and, they've been, and they've joined subcommittees. And I think what's interesting about that is um, it works vice versa too. So we've been able to connect, connect more community resources with those individuals. So the, the campuses have actually benefited from being more involved because you know, they don't always get the information. Like I said, we ch we're struggling with communication. And so they're able to hear from us the resources that we're talking about. I mean, there's, there's always a new resource that's available for them. And so I think it's really important for them to stay engaged because then they can take that back to their campus as well. So um, I think it, it does work both ways um, in a um, engagement standpoint. Rachel, Leo, do you have anything to add? Yes, um, I was gonna say we, I actually stole this from Houston ISD when Rose Tyrone was there. We, she had told me that she was including board members on on the shack, and so we include two of our board members on the shack. They are non-voting members. Um, obviously, they're not going to vote on their recommendations that are going to be coming to them for later action. But they sit on the committee and they attend. Um, my my chain of command it always knows when we're going to have a shack, and they could try to stop by if they can. Um, and if we have, depending on what is coming up in SHAC, we may include a principal. Um, we do have our directors of counseling on that, but if we need people from a campus level, we try not to pull on them too much because they get pulled a lot. But if we need them for a particular meeting or for something like that, we will invite them to that particular meeting. Leo, go ahead. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> oh, that's all right, um, Michelle. I, I totally agree with uh, Rachel in the sense that um, board members and other administrators are always, um, they're, they're always invited to attend the meetings. However, the majority of the people that are in the shack usually are directors from nutrition, um, health, mental health services, health services. Uh, usually in our school district, if we do involve principals or we do have issues, what we usually do is we have subcommittees to involve them and, and discuss the, uh, the issues with them that we're either going to uh, entertain or issues that we're going to look at as a shot. Uh, because of COVID and stuff like that, and it's, it's harder to meet in person, uh, we have extended invitations to principals and people at the campus level uh, to go out there and, and get involved in our Zoom meetings. But assuming that we're going back to in-person uh, meetings and, and meeting people in person, we at our school district would prefer to have subcommittees with people at the campus level than to have them in, in our in our uh, district shack meetings. Okay, thanks. Another question, can you offer some suggestions on how to better communicate with parents and the school community? I know um, one of the things I've heard from some of my schools 
is using the virtual platform that uh, the schools that the kids are learning on is one thing that can be done now that we couldn't do before because the parents are seeing everything that their kids are learning at home. So that if you find a way to access that uh, learning platform, that's an option. Um, but the rest of you guys, what can you share on that one? Hey, hey, Michelle. I'm happy. I'm happy to, to jump in here. Um, I think the one thing I think I maybe have mentioned is communication challenges a lot. Um, and I think, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we do have a Twitter feed. Um, we have um, a we have a district Facebook page. Um, and the district has been very kind in letting us use that to send out announcements or to post things as it relates to SHAC. Um, we do use our, our district newsletter as well. Um, and then another thing that we recently implemented is a system where we're leveraging SHAC liaisons that our parents or um, we have parent educators as well at our Title I campuses. And their job is to get that information back to the campus. And so they're actually serving as our communication channel to the campuses and to share that information with campus wellness committees, with principals, um, to make sure that that information is getting transferred back. So we've leveraged more of a, a little bit more of a robust um, infrastructure to get um, the information back out because we did find that to be very challenging um, to get the information out to parents. Um, so. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah. Michelle, yes. one of the things that we do is uh, we uh, connect with our campus parental involvement liaisons and they are the people that actually communicate with the parents as far as inviting them to the shack, becoming part of our members and also relaying some of that information. Uh, and what we did is we uh, have their supervisor as part of our shack committee. So what they do Hello. is they Please leave a message they're able to uh, relay a lot of the information at the campus level through each of the campus parental involvement uh, liaison, which does a great job communicating with parents and keeping them up to breast on some of the current things that we do with our shack. Thanks. Rachel, do you have any advice on communication? I don't know that I, I have anything new to add, but we do make sure that our website is up to date, try to include as much information there as possible. Um, but I think we're all doing pretty similar stuff. It's, it's, it's really challenging. I know um, the district will, some districts will send out newsletters and trying to get uh, an article on Shack in some type of a back to school uh, communication would be a really good way to get information out there. Um, anything you can access through the district. Um, that's going out to parents anyway and have an opportunity to share something is would be really helpful. Alice, did you have something you wanted to add? I did, I did. Um, so one of the things that um, I'm coming from a really small uh, rural school district and somewhere in the comments uh, questions, we'd had something related to kind of communication and getting involvement um, from a rural perspective or a small school district perspective. Um, one of the approaches that um, our school district has used um, is uh, as we have started opening up this, this uh past uh, school year. Um, obviously with COVID um, being still an issue, um, we, we began to host um, some small events at our school. Um, in, in rural communities, um, the school is the hub for everything in our area. Um, all kinds of events are hosted at our school. And so um, right prior to our senior night um, for basketball that was held, um, we, we actually had um, the school principal, um, you know, who is a trusted school uh, person that everybody knows, 
we had um, one of our board members also um, kind of take the floor, um, uh, the gym floor where everybody was at and just talk a little bit about a couple of the committees, um, not specifically only SHAC, but actually talked about um, a district improvement committee um, where we were needing uh, one or two volunteers to serve, um, talked about, mentioned SHAC and needing a couple of members on that group. Um, and just hearing from those trusted individuals to say, hey, we are looking for a couple of community um, and parent volunteers. Um, please consider coming to talk to me afterwards if you're interested. Um, and that actually did resonate and we were able to, to um, garner some more interest in a couple of our committees. Um, and so, uh, although I know we've moved to a lot of virtual um, uh, meetings and so forth, I think in rural communities that face-to-face -face interaction and that personal ask is still really important. And so um, that's just a, another idea um, that, someone, that someone could consider. I also wanted to share, and I should have said this a while ago, um, another thing you can do for kind of getting more information about Shaq, but also in recruiting people, because I saw that question being asked, get with your PTAs and your PTOs. Uh, at PTA level, they usually have a healthy lifestyle chair but it's a great way to tap into a group of people that are trying to make a change on a campus as well, to get information to them about the shack. You get, sometimes you can get members from that. They will have ideas about parents that are very interested in health and wellness. Those are a great resource that we often underutilize in our school districts. And I have a lot of our parents are actually the Healthy Lifestyle Chair over the year for their PTAs. Very good advice, thank you. So I'm going to cherry pick some of these questions um, so that we get to ones I think people are probably most interested in. Can you share with us uh, what does a shack meeting look like at your district? How do you host a successful shack meeting? Do you send out agendas in advance? Do you plan them out on a yearly basis? Uh, what happens at a shack meeting? I'm going to ask Leo to, to respond first. Well, first thing that we do is that we set our, our shack meetings up for the year so that everybody, so there's transparency and everybody knows what, what dates are at. And what we usually do is we get information from uh, some of our administration, some of our shack members on key issues or key um, topics that you want to go out there and, and talk about. And what we do is we send agendas ahead of time so that they can review and then we come back and we usually would have them in person at set locations within the district. Now, of course, we're having them uh, with Zoom, but uh, we do try to have transparency in having the agenda set out uh, with plenty of time and having the dates uh, set. Usually we would have them after five o'clock so that working parents would be able to attend and we would usually have them in different parts of our district. Um, usually if there's going to be a topic of discussion that may uh, involve the campus, then we decide if we are going to either make a subcommittee or we're gonna invite those people uh, to attend our meeting as well. Um, but I've noticed that uh, having meetings before five o'clock uh, prevents a lot of your parents from actually attending. So therefore we try to make it at a date and a time where all stakeholders will be able to attend and, and have successful uh, participation from all of them. Thanks, Leo. Uh, Stephanie. Yes, so um, I was I was taking notes um, to make sure I mentioned some things. Um, so we do set our dates ahead of time as well. We share those dates with our school board, actually in our annual report that we do at the end of the school year. So we have those dates set ahead of time um, so that we can get those the rooms we you know reserved when we did it in person and make sure that everyone's engaged that way. Um, we also meet around lunchtime. So we meet at noon. And I think we've we've done surveys and asked you know everyone what the best times are and usually it's a fight between the evening and the, and the lunchtime. 
Um, I know a lot of districts serve lunch or they before COVID, they would serve lunch, partner with their child nutrition department to serve lunch during those times to help support um, more attendance. Um, but we find that lunchtime meeting is a, is a good time for us. Um, we do meet, we are the executive committee meets beforehand to discuss the agenda. And we also have a um, strategic planning meeting with the district employees for each of the areas of coordinated school health. So we are on board with what's happening that way um, prior to those meetings. So we know if there's any big updates that need to be made at the, the general SHAC meeting, we can share those as well. And then the one thing that has been nice about having um, you know, a new SHAC chair is that they can do things the way they want. And recently our SHAC chair has done a theme for each meeting and the themes are, um, you know, that kind of gave light to like what we're focusing on um, engaging with and things like that. So that was a nice, um, a nice introduction to doing something a little bit different. Um, but typically, you know, our meetings consist of um, updates, sharing information, discussion points, action items. Um, we typically don't do subcommittee meetings after the meeting. We do those on another month. Um, but I know a lot of shacks will do their subcommittee breakouts right after the meeting because everyone's already there. Um, so that can be a common. Um, uh, practice of, of shacks. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, you need to unmute Rachel. Well, I thought I did that first, but um, just like everybody else, we uh, make sure that the calendar dates are up on our website and that our board and everybody is aware of those calendar dates. Um, the agenda is set by um, our EC or things that are coming along. Like if a policy is coming, we know that we're going to do it in this particular day or recommendations are coming at this point. Um, we do our committee meetings as part of our shack. So we will, in our um, meeting dates, we mark which one of those meeting dates will be committees so people know. And we actually, in April, host an only committee date. So it isn't for a full SHAC council to come. It is just for a committee to util utilize that date if they need it to do work. But we put all of those on the calendar so that all of our SHAC members know from the very beginning that these are the times they need to block out. And then during our meetings, what we'll do, especially on a committee day, we may have a presentation that's pertinent to something they're going to be doing in their committees, a charge that they're going to have, or it could be just an overall presentation, we'll adjourn, and then they go into their committee meetings. When they go into their committee meetings, we used to house committee meetings within SHAC, but what we noticed is committees would end and be done with the work, and they, need to, they could be leaving, and another committee is still going, and the SHAC hadn't adjourned yet. So by adjourning and then allowing the committees to meet, it allowed them to be able to leave when they had completed their work if there was different workloads amongst the committees. Who did I mute? I think, Rachel, I think I muted you instead of myself while ago, sorry. Uh, another question, how, how involved is your district administration with your school health advisory council? I think something was asked earlier about district administrators attending meetings and things. We may have touched on it a bit, but um, is your district administration supportive of your SHAC and, and how do they engage with SHAC? I know our district administration would actually bring things to us to discuss and say, we would like your input on this. So, um, Love to know how your district administrators uh, participate with you. Leo? Um, we do have district administrators in the SHAC and it's usually uh, the coordinators and directors and from different facets, from physical education to health services, nutrition, uh, our counselors or mental health. However, we usually do, uh, we had, we actually communicate with our assistant superintendents and superintendent before anything goes to the school board. And usually that's where we start working on, on either making sure we have enough research or data and making sure that uh, it's very clear that we've had either subcommittees or communicated with our principals. So therefore, we do have administrators that are in the SHAC, but that part of the SHAC does a uh, recommendation to our assistant superintendents 
if if they're in areas that affect their affect them. And then we do uh, communication with our superintendent to make sure that he uh, is able to uh, clearly communicate to the school board what the what the shack's recommendation or what the uh, rationale behind this possible change is at. So uh, we do have administration in the shack and we do have uh, recommendations to our assistant superintendents and superintendent before it goes to the board. Uh, Rachel. Um, I'm trying to make sure I'm unmuted and video is on. Um, yeah, check, check. We do, um, obviously we have lots of directors and executive directors that are sitting on our shack, but in terms of associate superintendents, um, superintendent, usually what we're doing is we're just keeping them aware. So as the district facilitator, I am making sure that they have an idea of when the meetings are coming, what may be occurring during those meetings, if we have something that I feel like is going to end up going up to executive staff and the board, I'm making sure that I'm letting them know way before a vote is coming forth. It is extremely important, especially with decisions and things that are going to be going. You never want a shack to feel like their word or their voice is going to get trumped. So as we were saying earlier, it's extremely important that we're guiding them to make sure they're successful. If you're using your executives and your associate superintendents and making sure they're aware, they help guide you as well because sometimes there's things we're not aware of as well that need to be included in a decision-making process. So we just, if there's something that I feel like we're gonna go above, I'm sharing that with them so that they can give us feedback and then forth, move forward. It does help having board members sit on the shack as well because again, they can give feedback from their perspective as to what they know is going on from their plate. Thanks. Stephanie. So I, I, I would say I echo um, Leo and Rachel's comments. I think that it's very important to have administration presence. Um, and, and I think too, that that's how we can learn from what's happening in the district, right? We can understand the policies and procedures that exist. So um, I, I definitely think it's an important component to have. I don't know if I have much else to add. <laughs> I agree. Um, I had a question, how is the shack different from a wellness team or would they be the same? The shack or school health advisory council is mandated by law at the district level. So it is a district level committee. Uh, normally when you think about a wellness team, I, I think in terms of a campus level wellness team where those would be different people that are working on the campus level as opposed to the district level. Um, the district could call it a district wellness team as opposed to a shack. But uh, like I said, in, in, in Texas anyway, it is mandated that you have a school health advisory committee at the district level. <clears throat> it, the composition would be similar to the wellness team or to the team that USDA requires to work on wellness policies. In fact, uh, when, they, when they identified who they wanted on the uh, wellness teams to work on wellness policies. We had established guidelines on who should be on a shack and they pulled from our guidelines and put that in as part of their uh, requirements. So um, I hope that helps answer your question. Uh, another question from the group, how do you find out about state laws or policies governing topics that relate to shack concerns? Um, that's where NASB comes in. One of the resources we're going to share in a little while um, actually has all the state policies for all the districts around school health issues. So um, that would be the most comprehensive source for you. Um, the Department of State Health Services will have some laws. Um, are y'all aware of any other uh, resources for state laws on policies? Um, the legal is the state law. So every school district usually located somewhere on their website will have policy. Okay. Um, it's usually under the board. I think that's where I usually find it for most of our districts. It will be under the board and the legal will be the same for all of our districts because that is pushed down from the state and this is the legal policy. So if you go in and you go to your board, most of them have a search engine of some sort within their policies. 
and you can search for words that you are finding pertinent to be able to pull up all the different things. Um, regulations don't always, um, are not always included in that search. So you may have to kind of dig a little bit further, but for uh, local and legal policy, you will be able to find that through their policies. It should be on their website and it's usually under the board. Okay. Guess it helps if I unmute myself too. So is there a specific policy that you have been involved with that um, you worked through the process and recommended to the board? If you do, I'd love for you to share your experience um, with passing a policy. Um, we'll start with Stephanie this time. So one of the policies obviously was the wellness policy. Um, so a more comprehensive um, uh, policy that, that we passed. Um, and, and the process wasn't um, quick. It wasn't, um, it wasn't simple, but it was, um, it was comprehensive. And I think that was what was successful about the um, wellness policy um, passing was that we did um, engage with multiple stakeholders. Um, we engaged with um, parent groups, community groups, we made sure that we had lots of representation so that when we did take it to um, our executive team and they asked, what about you know this group did they what what do they think we could say yes they were in this group so we kept track actually of who was who was all the um the parties that that looked over it um and again i go back to that experience was very valuable for i think district employees we had individuals from our legal team who said oh because we were putting in our policy something about the time to eat lunch and that kids need a certain amount of time to eat lunch and they were like oh that happens they have time <laughs> we were like no, there, there's a struggle to get kids through lunch lines. You know, it's hard to do that. We need a policy around that. And so I think, you know, really it's hard if you're not able to, to make it to all those campuses. And that's why having all those different opinions to come in and the varying um, viewpoints of stakeholders has been helpful because we're able to um, support our, our reasons for wanting things changed um, and leveraging the resources that we've had. I think the other thing that we did draw upon when we were looking at the wellness policy was looking at other sample wellness policies that exist um, and taking language from that or seeing what would fit, um, seeing what others had included and, and what works. So I think don't don't be afraid to reach out to other districts to say, you know, how did you do this process? What experiences did you find valuable? Um, I think sharing all that information can make um, the process a lot more streamlined. Um, and, you know, it's really important to, you know, not reinvent the real, wheel, um, but really kind of engage with what's already um, out there. I will say too, we um, have recess recommendations um, and our recess is now in our wellness policy as well. But, you know, sometimes recommendations are just as strong as a policy. And so we were we thought that it would be more important to get these recommendations passed immediately than to, to do a whole recess policy. Um, and so we drafted recess recommendations that went out to the principals and still caught caught attention and, and, and you know, did what we needed it for it to do. So sometimes it doesn't have to be, you know, as comprehensive as the policy, but making a recommendation for something um, just to bring it to the, the, the conversation and to share the information is valuable. I think that's a really good way to get started. I mean, if, if you're having struggling to get policy in front of the board, make them a recommendation and getting them used to the whole concept um, can make it easier to pass farther down the, the, the way. Hmm. Sorry, someone's telling me that chat has been disabled. If, if chat is not working, then just use Q&A, I guess. <clears throat> I'm not sure why it would be disabled. Um, Leo, do you want to share a bit? Yes, uh, Michelle. I, you know, just like Stephanie was saying, uh, I think uh, recommendations can also be um, interchanged with guidelines. And although it may not have you know, enough uh, backing or maybe it's not ready to become policy, I think it's, a good, uh, it's good to set some uh, guidelines or recommendations that you can base your policy making in the future. For example, um, recess, that seems to be a big topic for elementary to where um, now you have your recess before lunch 
uh, and, and giving some guidelines. So in, within those recommendations or those guidelines, you can have very specific recommendations as far as time. And then you can also have broad recommendations or guidelines for them to follow. But sometimes uh, it is very difficult to make things into policy. So therefore, I agree with Stephanie that it is important uh, to go out there and, and have some guidelines and recommendations for principals and PE teachers to follow. It seems to be at the elementary level, the biggest issues are having daily recess and also the time frame for kids to eat. Because it seems like a lot of times kids are pushed out and a lot of people outside the school, including school board members or parents, don't realize that uh, you know some of these students do not have enough time to eat and they would rather play. So therefore, it is important to put uh, specific time guidelines, whether it's recess or whether it's lunch, and having that data before you can actually make uh, some of these uh, guidelines into policy with your superintendent and your board. Um, I'm just, just going to add a, a regulation is often um, a good way to go when it comes to local or legal, largely because you don't have to take a regulation all the way to the board for changes or tweaks. But that I will say when we first did our um, wellness policy, we were one of the first uh, few districts that actually tied a regulation immediately to it. And we did that because we wanted everybody to understand how to manage all the aspects of the actual wellness policy. You're not going to have detailed instructions or information like such as, you know, we want, it says mandatory recess for students every day, maybe in policy, but what is the length of time? Is it going to be allowed to um, be used as punishment? Can kids be pulled out? Then we tie the regulation into that part so it goes a little bit further and explain to the campuses. I feel like if you have a regulation set up, it does help you in achieving more um, with your policy than if you just have the legal and the local, which are very, well, I hate to say vague, they can't be very vague. They don't have the working aspects to them. Thank you. I think we're um, need to begin closing out. Uh, I would love to know if you have uh, some advice on how you've dealt with things through COVID. Um, if each of you could talk a little bit about that and how that has impacted your participation um, involvement. I know in some cases it's been a positive, in some cases um, not so much. So if you guys could share a bit about that and then we will go through the resources um, and uh, let you guys um, continue your day. So, uh, Leo. I think um, COVID has been a big challenge. However, um, going through virtual meetings has enabled people to actually participate in the meetings from either their house or their business or their workplace. Uh, so therefore, it's really important to reach out to some of the uh, SHAC members, either through email. I know uh, we've also done some things with uh, Remind but sometimes just reaching out in person and making sure that that person, you know, is a valuable member of your shack and, and, and that, you know, you would like to see them in those meetings is very important because uh, before that face-to-face -face contact and that human interaction is, is, is what we're missing now. And I think uh, sometimes just reaching out to people personally, you know, either through uh, a text or actually through a phone call. Is, is important to making sure that they, they are uh, part of your shack and that they are valued members. Great, um, Rachel. Um, I don't feel like it has changed dramatically with COVID. We, you know, had our Zoom set up, figure out how to get everybody to be able to utilize Zoom has been a little bit of a challenge, but once we kind of worked through it, we had our last night meeting and we all felt like it was much better. We had figured out how to send confirmations before and make sure that everybody's finding their Zoom links. It seemed to be the most popular thing, them losing their Zoom link. But our attendance has been good. The only issue I think that we've run into the most, unfortunately, is a lot of our parents will serve as subs for our campus. And many have been being pulled because subs are such a high commodity right now. You can't get a hold of them. 
and we have had people not attending as much as they would normally do but we have a google drive set up for our shack and when a committee meets they put their notes and their information in there so that allows any member to be able to go back in afterward if they missed and catch up on what we achieved during that meeting so i think for the most part um, the structure was in place to support us having to go to covid but i know they all miss seeing each other face to face Uh, Stephanie, sorry. Yes, so same here. Um, you know, it's been exciting to see so many um, people engage with our shack um, and be able to join. And we actually were just having this conversation yesterday. You know, at, at some point we had 100, 100 people join the shack meeting, which is great, um, but it almost devalues our members who have been on the shack for, you know, seven, eight, nine years. They're thinking, well, if anyone's joining these meetings, what's the value for me? And so we've had strong conversations around what, how can we make the members, like Leo said, how can we make the members still more valued? Personal connection is really hard right now. You know, a lot of people are zoomed out. So we have some strategies that we're going to attempt to try with breakout sessions to engage just our members. Um, during the meeting and, and give more of an, an informative update for everyone that wants to join, but then really engage our members that way. Um, and then also um, in, in, ter in terms of actual contact, um, again, people do want to be social. They do want to be face to face. And so we're going to see if we can't arrange some volunteer engagement opportunities for our SHAC members specifically coming up so that they, if they feel comfortable and, and you know, practicing proper safety COVID guidelines, if they can actually gather and do a volunteer engagement activity that relates to health and wellness so that we can you know, re-engage with people and see them because that's why they join. They, they want to make a difference. They want to be social. They want to be engaged. Um, and they just haven't had that, that capacity this year. So um, that's been a I think that's been our biggest COVID challenge is, is the engagement piece um, virtually. It's just, you know, you don't have that same social um, connection that you do in a face-to-face -face meeting. Thanks, guys. Okay, um, we've had a, a pretty good group of questions out there. I think we've kind of over over time a little bit, and I want to run through some of these resources real quickly. Um, I have had several questions about whether you will get the recording, and yes, we will send the recording. We'll send a PDF file with hopefully the links active um, for the resources that are listed that you're about to see, and then uh, other resources that. I will share that we can also uh, send you copies to or links. Um, School Health Index was mentioned. That's a CDC assessment tool, which covers different components of school health. Um, and it's a great tool for you to use. It is something that is done at the campus level for the most part. Um, and it's a good way to assess how your school is doing. WellSat is a policy tool. You can use that to assess your school wellness policy and see how strong it is or where you may have some challenges or opportunities for improvement. If you love to play 60 also has uh, some tools as do the Alliance for Healthier Generation that you can explore. Um, the T-Shack, which is the Texas state level shack has come up with some uh, tools for you as well. Um, they have an assessment tool just to see if your shack is um, doing things as it should. Are the member roles defined? Um, have they had orientation? Do they understand what resources are available? Um, just different things that would relate directly to your, your uh, school health advisory council's uh, processes and, and uh, structure. Um, you might consider using this. It's downloadable from the, the Department of State Health Services. And it's something that you could do with your shack, which would give you a better idea of, of where you are. They also, since uh, shacks are to report to the board once a year, they put together a report to the board PowerPoint. So this is something that can help, help you out if you have not done an official report in person to the board um, and want to do something like that, you might wanna look that over. And then they've also compiled some different documents um, on specific topics that could be very useful to you, um, kind of circling around the, the components of coordinated school health. The recesses in there with some information on what you can do, physical activity for youth, 
different topics. So these are all great things that can help your shack. Um, then Action Healthy Kids uh, worked on this tool. It is based on the School Health Index and it's a way to help you determine um, your strategy, what you, where you want to spend your time. Um, so it's one of the things that can really make your shack most successful is to be able to identify what the priorities are for your district. Um, we'll send a, a copy of this along with uh, our uh, PowerPoint and other information. But basically you rank your, your different topics. Um, you can add your own topics. But the higher the score, the more likely it is that this is something that your district might want to focus on. But it doesn't include everything. So for instance, I was working with a school district in San Antonio and they added to this, um, they were worried about kids who were hungry on weekends and that ended up being one of their priorities. So make sure that you know your shack, if you're looking uh, to get a shack going uh, that's kind of languishing, finding a priority that everyone in the, in the district or the parents in the community accepts as being important uh, to work on may be the best way to get your shack going. I know we've had a lot of uh, discussions around vaping. Um, that's something that uh, districts are working on in a lot of cases, um, but may not be at the top of their list. So if, if that's something that's really causing issues in your district, that may be something you want to consider. But again, this is a tool that you can use to help you um, identify which areas are most important to you. As you go through thinking about possible focus areas, uh, these criteria can be helpful to think about. Is this a problem that is impacting a majority of students? Um, if so, then it's gonna be more likely to gain a larger support. How serious a problem is it? Is it something that's causing um, severe um, health issues? Um, is it something new or is it something that's developing? Um, it may be something that, you know, may be not right now, but next year might be a better choice. Are some students more affected than others? Making sure that you're looking at this thing from an equity perspective. Uh, and then if, if there are support, is support for this issue and resources to deal with it. So is this a problem, actual problem, or is it a symptom? Sometimes we need to look past um, what we think the problem is and look to the root cause to help actually deal with it. So going through this process can really help your shack think about what's going on and where they might want to focus their issues. These are some of the resources that we've talked a little bit about. There is a Texas shack guide, which uh, the Department of Sales Services just uploaded a new version, I believe, and it can give you more details on you know, how a shack should proceed and what a meeting would look like and um, membership and things like that. So you might want to go there and download a copy of that. Um, the Texas Education Agency has the laws that govern um, school health advisory councils on their website because they have posted all of the rules that, that the shacks live by. Um, and then the Department of Agriculture has some great resources around local wellness policies and requirements that you can access. Um, someone mentioned earlier, I think it was Rachel mentioned, getting with your Texas PTA. They do have a healthy lifestyles uh, program and they do have resources there that can be useful as well. And then um, I mentioned the State School Health Policy Database. NASB has just updated this and uh, it, has, it has policies from across the US, different states, different school districts, um, so this is something that can really help you if you want to see sample policies. CDC has a lot of great resources. Um, and then CSPI is the group I mentioned. They have put together a lot of information around school nutrition and the beverage environment. And then um, there's the CDC link for um, the School Health Index. We have another webinar tomorrow at uh, the same time. If you're interested in attending, you can access that registration at our, uh, our national website, actionforhealthykids.org. Um, it will be uh, a little less talk from me and, and more talk from some additional school districts about um, what's made them successful. So these were successful school districts we had today. We have some more tomorrow to share a little bit more wisdom 
um, around how they've managed to, to be successful shacks. Um, and then this is our last webinar for this school year. On May 11th, we're working with It's Time Texas, and they are putting together a panel who is going to talk about how to get the community involved. Um, and we hope to have um, rural areas, um, different size school districts, so that you get some good information across the board. So you can register for that as well. Uh, again, I'm Michelle Smith, a state coordinator, and I am always available to answer questions. Um, shoot me an email. I'm happy to um, have a phone conversation or answer via email. I hope this has been uh, useful and uh, giving you some good information for moving forward with your shack. As I mentioned earlier, we do have archived videos and webinars on YouTube. You can either go to YouTube and search for Healthy Kids, Healthy Families, or you can click on the link when we send the, the PowerPoint information to you. So that is all we have for today. I wanna to thank Stephanie and Leo and Rachel for joining us and Alice for being my co-host and, and chiming in as well. Um, have a great rest of the day and I hope you have successful shacks that will uh, be uh, able to make the school environment a, a healthy one for your students. Thank you. Thanks guys, appreciate you.